Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Ready. I tell you, just to remind you, I mean, we've already seen today a better sermon than I could ever preach when we saw three people follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Uh, it doesn't get much better than that. And then uh, I, I love, um, I've never told Matthew this, and I mean this, I'm not just saying it. I love how you string songs together to accomplish a theme and a message. And I want you to, I mean, just think about what we just sung. This is amazing grace, right? God's grace and reminded us of that. And then if you've been saved by his grace, you should be a nobody trying to tell somebody about it. I mean, you, you with me? Or whatever the phrase goes, whatever it goes. Uh, you should be that, though. And so, uh, man, thank you, Matthew, for this morning. And uh, I'm just excited to be here. If you have your Bible, would you turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 7? 1 Samuel chapter 7. It is, uh, I know I sound like a broken record every chance to get to preach on Sunday mornings here, but it's just such a humbling thing, and I'm so excited and uh, just so grateful that the preacher would allow me to fill in his shoes this morning. And uh, I wish this morning that uh, I'm really tempted to, to get up here and talk trash to him about his golf tournament tomorrow. Uh, I wish I could, because uh, I'm bringing in some family members to play with me, and because I know I'm not that good. So I'm bringing in people that I know are good to play with me. And, uh, and that's the struggling thing, because I want to talk trash to him, but I've seen him play, played with him, and he is way better than me, like not even close. And so uh, I'm ready to play in his golf tournament tomorrow, but I will tell you this, if we do happen to beat his team tomorrow, um, you will hear it from me if I ever get the chance to preach again. Because I don't mind talking trash from victory, you know what I'm saying? Like, I got, sometimes I kind of watch it a little bit before I win, but after I win, I don't mind dishing it out there too. So I'm excited for tomorrow morning though, I'm excited. Hey, let's pray together and then we'll dive into the word together. Well, we love you and uh, God, we're just so incredibly blessed by your presence already this morning. We, we thank you for the reminder um, Lord, that you're still saving people. Would you still save any young people? I love that we're in a church where we have seen every age of the spectrum the last few weeks baptized. Every single age of the spectrum, we've seen people who are following you in believers' baptism. And I thank you that you're still saving people in this church and, and allowing us to experience that. We praise you for that. Lord, I thank you for the reminder in the music that it's by your grace that we've been saved. And Lord, if we've been touched by your grace, then we should share you with other people. And Lord, I just pray that as we continue in worship right now, um, worship has not stopped this morning just because the music stopped. We're continuing to worship you right now in the way we study and respond to your word. So what I pray for me, I pray that you would just get rid of me. What I pray that you would empty me of me. And Holy Spirit, would you just use me this morning to not necessarily say something new, but just communicate what your word has already spoken. Lord, we believe your word is true when it says the grass withers and the flowers fall, but your word endures forever. And so help us approach it so this morning. We love you. We're thankful for this time together. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have you um, ever had to learn the hard lesson in life that you took something for granted? You, you had it around you so long, and then something happened, a moment or an event, and you, you realized that something that you loved, you actually really took it for granted and didn't realize how good it was until you didn't have it. Um, I remember when I was in this church, grew up in this church, and my senior year of high school, they sent me and Eli Blaylock, the youth pastor at our East Campus, down there with Alvin Summers now, and, uh, and my, one of my best friends in the world, Johnny Sprinkle. Uh, we went to go work in a church in Portland, Oregon, and uh, we're out there for six weeks the summer after my senior year of high school, and I realized that summer that I took Chick-fil-A for granted. <laughs> I, I realized it because in the Northwest, um, they don't have Chick-fil-A, and they're missing out, right? And so for six weeks, I didn't have it. So I get home and had Chick-fil-A for breakfast, lunch, went to La Unica for dinner, and then had it for lunch again the next day because uh, I missed it that much. Uh, but, you know, I, I think about the fact that I'm, I've been married now for three years this coming December, me and my wife, for three years, and uh, I'm learning that I took my parents for granted for a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, bills, uh, rent, mortgage, air, heat, like everything, right? Uh, I realized I took my parents for granted a lot. Um, I tell you what I've been learning in 2020 is that I took church for granted a lot. Um, man, I loved, I, I, for my whole life, like this is, you know, I, I, being the youth pastor here, I love it. It's one of the greatest blessings that God has given me. And it's, it's awesome for me because I've always loved church. And not, not just our church, I love our church, just church in general. I just love the people of God and, and love it. And, but I never realized how just in the routine I was of it. That every Wednesday night, we had high school student night. Every Sunday morning, we were in here. And until it was gone from you, you don't realize how much you love it, do you? 
And you know, I, I think that's interesting. It's something we need to guard ourselves on is, isn't it funny how the things that we love the most, if we're not careful, we can take them the most for granted. The things that we love the most, if we're not careful, that's what we end up taking the most for granted. And when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 7 today, um, the people of Israel have been through a lot. They've been through a lot in the last few chapters. And I would argue that the reason that they've been through a lot is because they came to a place in their walk with God as a nation and as a people. They'd come to a place where they had taken the presence of God for granted. And because they took the presence of God for granted, the Lord decided to to wake his people up because how many of you know sometimes we need to be woken up? (laughs) So sometimes we need God to get our attention. The Lord woke his people up by having the symbol of his presence, the Ark of the Covenant, removed from Israel. If you were to go back, just to set it up for us this morning to make sure we know where we are before we dive into chapter 7, if you were to go back in chapter 4, you see that the Israelites come into battle with the Philistines. They come into battle with the Philistines, and Israel starts losing. The Philistines are beating them, and so some of the Israelite leaders say, hey, let's, let's go get the Ark. Let, let's go get the Ark of the Covenant. Let's bring it into battle, and their thought was when we bring the Ark of the Covenant into battle, we're going to win. Uh, we're not going to lose, and, and that sounds good and well, but what had happened in the nation of Israel is that they had started worshiping other gods along with the God of Israel. They started worshiping other gods along with the one true God. And so when they're bringing in the ark, they're not bringing it in as the one God whom they're focusing on and worshiping and following in, but they're, they're almost bringing it in as like a good luck charm, just abusing God's presence, saying, if we bring in the ark, we are going to win. And to our shock and to their shock, when they bring in the ark of the covenant, they bring it into the battle and the Philistines not only win, but the Philistines take the ark of the covenant back into Philistine country. Now, mind you, I think we need to be reminded today, um, God didn't lose, right? Like, God doesn't lose, okay? So let's just make sure we're clear there. But, but God, in order to wake his people up, said, you took my presence for granted. Try living for a little bit when the symbol of my presence is not with you. So as you read, though, God does not let the ark stay there long. They take it in the Philistine country, and city after city in the Philistines are inflicted with plagues, because they basically have the Ark of the Covenant there, and God's declaring to the Philistine people, my, my Ark shouldn't be in your cities, right? And so it, as you read the story, eventually they get to a place where they say, we're, we're done with this, we're done with the plagues. They literally take two milk cows, attach a cart to the cows, put the Ark on the cart, throw some gold on it, and just push it in the direction of Israel and say, get out of here. And they send the Ark back to Israel. And at this point in the story, The ark is back in Israelite country at the house of Abinadab, but it's still not where it's supposed to be. Still not in the tabernacle. And for the people who have been uh, really abusing the presence of God and taking the presence of God for granted, they are finally in a place in this chapter where they start to long for the presence of God again. Where they start to long for the Lord's presence to be with them in the way it used to be. And so that's where we are when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 7. So let's read verse 3, and we're just going to kind of work our way through this this morning and let this story unfold before our eyes. So 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3. It says, And Samuel said to all the houses of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the asterisk from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you from the hand of of the Philistines. I, I love Samuel here because the, the people have had a history of sin, right? They've had a history of following other gods, and they have this moment where they turn and they want to follow the Lord again. And it's almost like Samuel's kind of vetting them out a little bit. Because how many of you have been around in church long enough to know that we're really good at saying the right thing? Right? Like we're really good at saying the things we're supposed to say. And so that the people are saying we want to follow God again. And it's almost like Samuel, Samuel comes at it and says, okay. If you're really returning to the Lord with all your heart, like if you're really coming back to God, forsaking everything to worship him, there's two things you need to do. And the first thing is right there where he says, the first thing you must do is to put away foreign gods. The first thing, if, you, if it's true, Israel, if, if you're really returning to me with all your heart, the first thing you must do is to put away idols. If you, uh, if you read the Old Testament, it doesn't take a Bible scholar to see that God is not a big fan of idol worship. God's not a big fan of his people 
worshiping other gods. If you uh, were to read the book of Exodus, when God gives his people the Ten Commandments, the, the first commandment is what? You shall have no other gods before me. What, what's the second command? He says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. God is very clear with his people that false gods and idols are not something that should be a part of their daily life. It's amazing when you read the prophets how intense they take that stance from God. The, the prophets uh, equalize and equate worshiping other gods to spiritual adultery. Where God is saying your devotion and your heart and your affection should be towards me. It should not be towards other gods. And yet the problem with the people of Israel in 1 Samuel is that they started worshiping other gods. They've started worshiping the God of Baal. They've started worshiping the goddess of Ashtoreth. They've begun to worship other gods. And Samuel says, if it's true you're returning to the Lord, then you need to throw those idols in the trash. Now let's make sure for a second that we don't make the mistake of assuming that Israel is so much different than we are. Because how many of y'all know we still deal with idol worship today? I mean, it might not be, you know, a little carved image that we put in our bedroom that we bow down to before every day. It might not be something sitting in our den to use a family, gather around every day. But there are many things in life that we are more tempted to give our time to than to God, isn't there? There are many things in our life that we are more tempted to give more affection to than our God. There's things, if we're not careful, we're more willing to give financially to than our God. I really wish Preacher Mike was here for that one. He would have amen me really good right there. But is it not true? If we look at them, we're like, oh, we're not different. We're so much different from them. We don't have like idols. But, but do we really? We, we have idols as well. And God is telling his people, get rid of those and follow me. He says, if you return to the Lord, you got to do two things. The first is get rid of the idols. And look at the second thing he says. It's similar to the first. He tells them, to direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. Serve him only. Can I just remind you this morning, God does not desire split allegiances from us. That it's not like we can come to the Christian faith and go, okay, God, I'm going to serve you uh, 51% of the time. That's the majority, right? 51%, but then the other percentage is I'm going to divvy up over here. No, God says, I want you to direct your heart to me and direct it to me only. Uh, you know, I remember uh, in Colossians chapter 1, my mind goes there where the Bible says that Jesus is preeminent over all things. He's, all things are created by him, through him, and for him, and he is preeminent over all things. See, where we're often tempted is we think it's enough to make Jesus prominent. If we're not careful, we, we think it's enough in our life to make Jesus prominent. What does prominent mean? It means important, right? There might be many of you today, like, oh, yeah, Jesus is important in my life, like, Jesus is an important thing. I'm here, right? I'm watching online. Like, uh, Jesus is important. But what, what the God is of the Old Testament, New Testament, because he's the same God, amen, what he's calling his people to do and what he's calling us to do is say, it's not just enough to make Jesus important. It's not just to make me important in your life. I am to be preeminent in your life over all things. There's not really a second place. Like, he is above all and over all. And so Samuel says, if you're following God and if you're really returning to him, Throw away your idols and direct your heart to the Lord only. Now, um, we, we give Israel a bad rap in the Old Testament a lot, don't we? Like, Israel's really fun to, to pick on. Like, we, we love picking on Israel because remember when they come out of the Red Sea and they've been freed from slavery and just a few chapters later, they're worshiping a golden cow. Remember that? Like, we, we love to, to pick on Israel and say, oh, we would never and, and pick on Israel and joke with them. But we need to give them credit here in this passage. But because Samuel lays this out, says, if you're returning to the Lord, throw away your idols, direct your heart to him only. He lays it out clearly. And let's look at their response in verse 4. It's a great response. It's a great one. Look at what it says. It says, so the people of Israel, they put away the Baals and the Ashtoreth, and they served the Lord only. And then Samuel said, gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered in Mizpah, and they drew water, and they poured it out before the Lord, and they fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. Can, can we give them some credit there? I mean, they do a lot of good things, don't they? I mean, Samuel lays it out. He says, if you're returning to the Lord, throw away your idols, direct your heart to God. What do they do in verse 4? They put away Baals, they put away the Ashtoreth, and they serve the Lord only. Not only that, what does the Bible say? It says they gathered at Mizpah for corporate worship. 
They, they've been avoiding this. They haven't been doing this. But in response to Samuel and in an effort to draw closer to God and return to him, they gather for corporate worship and prayer. I love when the Bible says that they poured out water before the Lord. That's kind of a rare thing in the Old Testament. You don't see that a lot. But what many scholars believe is that they are symbolically showing when they pour water out, they're saying, God, you are more important to us than this water that can sustain us. What an awesome picture, right? I mean, what an incredible picture. The Bible says that they fasted. Maybe the most impressive for the Israelites is that they confessed their sin. They didn't run from their sin. They didn't hide from it. They laid it out before God. And most impressive beyond that is that they willingly submitted themselves under the judgment of Samuel. Because how many of you know, do you remember a time when maybe you were like late elementary or middle school and you began to learn that your parents were smarter than you realized they were? And maybe there were some moments where you were, uh, you know, you were kind of being mischievous and you were in sin and disobeying them. And you kind of caught whiff that maybe they like knew what you were doing, you know, and you're like, I'm going to get out ahead of this. And I'm just going to go ahead and confess it and throw it out there because if I confess my sin, then maybe I won't have to be spanked for it, right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, how many of you ever been there before? I can confess and then might get out of punishment. Well, Israel, their confession is, is pure here, isn't it? Because they confess, not in an effort to get away from judgment, but Samuel judges them and they say, we, we recognize that we've sinned. We recognize that we've run from God. And so they submit themselves to judgment. This is a good moment for the Israelites, isn't it? It's a good moment. They're, they're doing a lot of good things, a lot of things I would prescribe to even us. But how many of you know this morning that you can be following Jesus as best you can? You can be attending church. You could have not missed a single service on, uh, you know, when we were live streaming everything, like super Christian alert, right? Like you didn't miss a single thing. You can be devoted. You can be doing all of the things right and trouble will still come knocking at your door. You ever been there? Where, where something comes up and you're like, God, I'm like, I'm following you right now. This is not like a Jonah type thing where I'm running from you. I'm following you and yet trouble still seems to come up. Look at what happens in verse eight. Or I guess in verse 7, excuse me. It says, Now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. So what happens? They gather to worship, and the Philistines hear that they've gathered, and they're like, okay, this is our moment, right? The, the people of Israel have gathered together. They're all in one place. This is our moment to attack. If you're an Israelite and you hear that's happening, what's your response going to be? I just, maybe I'm a little less sanctified than some of you, but I'm like, God, you got to be kidding me. I mean, we just started following you again. We're, we're here doing a good thing. We're here worshiping you, here uh, confessing our sin to you, submitting ourselves to judgment. God, we, we're doing all the things right, and yet you're still sending an army after us? God, I thought your word says that you were for me and not against me. God, I thought your word says that you were a rear guard and a shield for us. I, I thought your word said all of those things, and yet we're following you here. And the, and the people of Philistines are coming up against us. And we kind of expect that reaction because if you read the Old Testament, you know the Israelites are not very good at responding in crisis moments, are they? I think about when they're in the wilderness, right? And they've just gotten through the Red Sea. They've just been freed. And what happens? They start getting a little hungry and they look at Moses and say, Moses, it would have been better off if you'd have left us in slavery than just to die out here. Like they don't really respond well to crisis moments. And that's kind of what I'm expecting here. But look at what the Bible says in verse seven and eight. It says, and when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. Now, now I want us to notice something real quick together. They were afraid, weren't they? And you know what the Bible says? Like, it wasn't like they were like, oh, this ain't nothing. It wasn't like they were sitting there like, we're not afraid at all. No, the Bible says they were afraid. Can, can I just tell you, and, and you might think I'm less spiritual or something, but I don't care who you are. Some moments when they come up in life, the only response that kind of makes sense in the moment is to be a little bit afraid. And you can look at me and say, Justin, you should have more faith in that. I try to get to that place. But I'm talking about the initial reaction, the initial moment, the initial news that hits, the initial event that happens. Sometimes fear is the only response that makes sense, isn't it? 
But here's where I think we get in trouble. When, when that fear comes, if we're not careful, that fear leads us to discouragement. If we're not careful, that fear leads us to doubt. If we're not careful, that fear might lead us to anger. If we're not careful, that fear might lead us to isolation where we say, well, I'm just forgetting church, forgetting family, forgetting all that stuff. If we're not careful, fear can lead us down that road. But what I love about the Israelites is are they afraid? Yes, but look at where their fear makes them turn. It says they were afraid, but they looked at Samuel and said, Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord for us. Their fear drove them to the Lord. Their fear did not push them away. Their fear did not make them doubt and get angry, but their fear made them turn to God. I love how they looked at Samuel and said, Samuel, start praying and don't stop praying. Right? How many of y'all have stuff going on in your life where you need to look at someone and say, I don't need just a one-time prayer. That's helpful if you can give it to me, but I need you to pray for me, and I need you to not stop praying for me. That's what they did. They looked at Samuel and said, don't stop praying for us. And I love this because when you read through their history, they've been through a season where they tried to rely on their own resources. They've been through a season where they had their own gods that they worshipped. They, they tried to rely on what they could do and what they could accomplish, but they had come to learn the lesson that ultimately your resources and my resources sometimes are just not enough. They're sometimes not enough, and they turn to the Lord. See, sometimes we need to learn the difficult lesson. That sometimes just the physical things we have in life are not enough to cut it, aren't they? So sometimes money is great, but not every problem can be fixed with money, can it? The perfect relationship is everyone's goal, but sometimes the perfect relationship can't solve the pain that we have. Sometimes we want to turn to substances and other things, but ultimately those are just temporary and momentary. We need something bigger, and I love here in their fear, Israel turns to the Lord. They run to the Lord and say, Samuel, don't stop praying for us. So look at what Samuel does. Verse 9 says, so Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel. Now, now stop right there. Is that not an interesting battle strategy? Isn't it? I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, like, if I'm in Samuel's shoes and Israel just asked me to pray, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray for, like, a solid minute, you know, like, pray really hard, and it'd be a good prayer. I mean, I would take it seriously and like really pray, quote scripture, all that stuff. I'd pray really hard. And then as soon as I said amen, I would look around and be like, okay, how many swords do we got? <laughs> right? Like, like as soon as I finished praying, I'd be like, okay, let's, let's develop a battle strategy here. Uh, let, let's develop a battle plan, right? Let's just, you men over here, you men over here, and all these things. Like in my, in my flesh, that's what I'm thinking because the army's coming, aren't they? Like the army's closing in. I'm thinking, okay, the prayer's great. The prayer's awesome. That, that's great. But we need to start making some, some plans here, right? And what does Samuel do? He does the exact opposite. He says, I don't need a sword yet. We don't need to talk about armies yet. He says, get me a lamb. You know what's funny? When you read the Bible, God, um, he often has odd strategies for his people to use, doesn't he? God, God often gives his people odd strategies to use in battles and in moments of crisis. I think about when God sends Moses to Pharaoh. Remember the burning bush moment and God commissions Moses, he sends him to go. Uh, what does he send with Moses? A staff, right? <laughs> I told this in the first service, and so maybe I shouldn't say this again, but I'll say it again. I was like, God, like would a, like, an AR not have been better or something? Like, like, that's not a statement on guns. I'm just telling you, like a staff? Like, come on, God, like I need something, right? He's going in front of the most powerful person in the world, in the known world, Pharaoh, and God says, yeah, that staff's enough. Yeah. Well, what about the people of Israel when they come against Jericho, right? They, they come against Jericho, and it's this impenetrable city. And Joshua meets the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord says, okay, Joshua, here's your plan. For six days straight, you're going to walk around the wall one time, and on the seventh day, you're going to walk around the wall seven times. When you get to the end, give a loud shout, blow the trumpets, and just shout, and the walls will come down. <laughs> like imagine Joshua going back to that you know, planning room or whatever with his council, and that's the plan he brings forth. Like that don't make no sense, right? Um, I, I thought about Gideon. Remember the story of Gideon where Gideon has thousands of men at his disposal. Thousands of men. I love what God says. God says, you can't go into war with thousands because if you win with thousands, you're going to think that you had something to do with it. 
So if you're going to think you have something to do with it, I'm going to strip you from thousands and just give you 300 people. Go after it with that. Right? God has some odd strategies, but what we see in the Bible, I want you to remind us this morning, is that any strategy with God is a winning strategy. I mean, man, if you're with the God of the universe who spoke and all this began to form and exist, the one who's holding all these things together, it might look odd, but any strategy with God is a winning strategy. And I love how Samuel here responds in worship. He says, we don't need a sword yet. We don't need a plan yet. We're, we're good. Bring me a lamb. And we're going to worship. So look at what the Bible says. Verse 9. It says, the Bible says, Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel. And the Lord answered him. And as Samuel was offering the burnt offerings, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. Stop right there. Don't cheat. Don't cheat. Stop right there. Stop right there. <laughs> Dad's in this room. Imagine what that moment was like. Because the Bible paints a picture that these two things are happening simultaneously, doesn't it? It says, as Samuel is sacrificing the lamb, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. Imagine dad's in this room. I'm not a parent yet, but I can just imagine being there with my wife. And I got a protector, right? Got a defender. And I'm sitting there, hand in hand with my wife, and I'm watching this lamb being slain, and off in the distance, I see an army closing in. And I, I hear the armies over here, and I hear them over here, and it's closing in, and I'm maybe wondering, looking around, like, okay, this is a great worship time. This is awesome. Grace, grace, God's grace. But, like, we need to do something now. <laughs> what was that moment like? What an example of trust where the whole people of Israel gathered and they're worshiping God, saying, God, if you don't do something, we're done. Look at what the Bible says. I love this. It says, but the Lord. Isn't that an awesome phrase? Man, that's so good. Like Ephesians chapter 2, right? We were dead in our sins, uh, apart from God, but God, right? Whenever you see but the Lord, just underline it. And, and you need to say that to some situations in your life. You're sitting there thinking, man, this situation's terrible. This is so bad, and you're in the midst of it. But you can respond and say, but I know. But, but the Lord, he's doing something. He's, he's working something out. And I don't know what it is yet, but he's working it out. I wasn't going to say that, but I had to go there. But the Lord. Chaos is happening. Armies coming in. And the Bible says, but the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines. And he threw them into confusion. And they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and they pursued the Philistines and struck them as far below Beth Car. I love what the Bible says. It says that as the lamb was being slain, the Lord thundered. He thundered. Now, I don't know about you. Think about the most intense sound of thunder you've ever heard. And i got to imagine that does not hold a candle to the thunder the Lord produces here. The Lord thunders. And can I tell you what's awesome? This, this gets me excited. Uh, in, in this day and age, the, the battles, they, what they would have believed about battles is battles were happening on a physical plane, but they were also happening on a spiritual plane. Okay, so, so the army of the Philistines was not only just fighting the army of Israel, they would have seen it as the physical plane, but also what they would have believed is in battle, it was your God against their God. So, so it's not only just a physical who's better, but it's a spiritual who's better, our God or their God. And I love it what happens when the Philistines are running up, you've got to imagine. They're running up and maybe they're wondering, why, why aren't they picking up a sword? Why, why aren't they getting in a plan or an attack position? They're just sacrificing. This is going to be easy. And they get close to it, and then all of a sudden this thunder cracks out. And they realize these people ain't alone. <laughs> they, they, these people ain't on their own. And can I tell you what's even better? I'm tell you what's even better. It gets better. The Philistines worshiped the god Baal. You know who the god Baal, you know what they called him was? He was the rider of the clouds. What that meant was they believed Baal's primary function and primary power was bringing rain. He was bringing storms. He, in their mind, he was the god of thunder. Check this. When thunder goes out, they should have thought, okay, Baal's with us. But when God thundered, they said, that god's bigger than our god. <laughs> that, that god just made a sound that I never heard before. And the, and the word says that it threw them into confusion and the Israelites overtook them. See, this passage is such a good reminder because victory was not won by the might of the Israelites. 
It was not won by their sheer strength or their tactical brilliance. It was won when they surrendered to God. When they threw their idols in the trash, when they directed their affection and their worship to God, and when they sacrificed a lamb, that was when victory was won. It was won through the lamb that was slain. It was won. Let's see how the story ends. I love it. It says, then Samuel took a stone and he set it up between Mizpah and Shin and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, till now the Lord has helped us. Can I just tell you, this is not why I'm here this morning, but it's too good to to just pass over it. There there needs to be some Ebenezer set up in your families. In your families, you need to have some Ebenezers that are set up, some grandparents in this room where where you have dates marked out in your calendar. That when that date comes, you can gather your family together and say, look, on this date 40 years ago, I did not think me and your grandma were going to make it. But God did a work in our hearts, and now all of you are here to see the results of it. So some of you parents, moms and dads, you need to have some Ebenezers in your house, some Ebenezers that you can drive your kids to and say, hey, at that spot right there, if you'd have told me at that college, if you'd have told me in that high school that I would be sitting in a church on a Sunday morning, I'd have said you're crazy. But it was there that God saved my soul, got a hold of my life, and I am here now because of him. I, I, wear, I wear this bracelet. You can keep clapping. That's fine. I, I wear this bracelet that reminds me to pray for my dad. You know what? I cannot foresee a time when I will ever take this off. The Lord's going to see us through it. Amen. On how he's going to see us through it, but he's going to see us through it. But even 50, 60, Lord willing, 70, whatever years down the road, I want to be able to look at that and say, I remember in my darkest night, God was there. In my hardest moment, he was with me. He was for me. We need to be setting up Ebenezer's where we walk by them and say, that was where God showed up. That was where God moved in my life. If you don't have those as a family, I can't encourage you enough. Have them. Block out some dates. Set up some things in your house that are reminders of how God has moved. So he sets this up, and look at what it does. It says, the Philistines, they were subdued again. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And the cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath. And Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. And there was peace also between Israel and the Amorites. And so Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah. And he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would return to Ramah for his home was there. And there also he judged Israel, and he built an altar to the Lord. See, for the people of Israel, victory came, not by their strength, not by their tactical brilliance and expertise. It came when they turned to the Lord. It came when they got their idols away, when they directed their heart to him only. It came in the blood of the lamb when they surrendered to the Lord. Now, this would be a great place to stop, wouldn't it? But doesn't that, did y'all catch how, I hope y'all are still with me. Did that catch how good that sounded at the end of that passage? I mean, if you caught it, they defeat the enemies, right? That's what it says. The, the Bible says the Philistines never harmed Israel again. That's pretty awesome. The, the Bible says that not only did they defeat the enemies, but they went back and they retook the cities that the Philistines had taken from them. That's, that's pretty great. They have a great leader in Samuel. They have peace between them and the Amorites. I mean, the end of 1 Samuel chapter 7 is a pretty fairy tale storybook ending, isn't it? There's peace and tranquility. They have leadership. It's great. But the problem with stopping in 1 Samuel 7 is 1 Samuel chapter 8 comes. And in chapter 8, it's when the people decide that they don't want to be like all the other nations, or they want to be like all the other nations. They, they don't want to be different and be led by God. They want to be like all the other peoples and have a king. So Samuel warns them and They said, no, 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 we want a king. We want to be like everyone else. And God, in a very Romans 1 type fashion, hands them over to the desires of their heart to have a king. And while they have good leadership under Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 7, if you know anything about Israelite history, the kings are pretty rough, aren't they? There's some good ones, there's a few, but mostly it is is bad. And it sets Israel in a trajectory towards more idol worship, more covenant unfaithfulness, more sin, more rebellion until ultimately God's going to have to use Babylon to wake them up again. See, listen to me. Samuel 
was able to bring temporary peace. But Israel and we need someone who can bring eternal peace. Samuel was able to defeat the enemies for for a moment and have them vanquished for a season, but we need someone to vanquish our enemies forever. Samuel was able to be victorious for a moment and for a time, but we needed someone who could bring everlasting victory. I guess the way I'm trying to tell you is that Samuel is great, but Jesus is better. Samuel's really good. He's a good leader. And you can do that through all the Old Testament. Moses was a great leader, but Moses died and he stayed dead. Joshua was a great leader for his time, but Joshua died and he stayed dead. Samuel was a great leader in this moment, but but think about how Samuel and Jesus are different and how Jesus is better. Samuel said, hey, go get me a lamb, and Jesus came to this earth, and he said, I am the lamb. (laughs) Samuel sacrificed that lamb, sacrificed the lamb, and I got news for you. The Bible says nothing about the lamb getting back up and walking around again. The Bible says nothing about that. It was a temporary sacrifice, yet our lamb was slain for the sins of your sins, my sins, the sins of the world, and our lamb was buried in a tomb but he rose again three days later. So Samuel brings temporary peace, but now the prince of peace is reigning. Samuel brings temporary victory from his enemies, and our Savior has crushed his enemies. Samuel brings momentary victory, but Jesus has brought victory for eternity. Praise the Lord. So what I'm trying to tell you is our, I guess our formula to success is not that much different from the Israelites. You might have thought, we're not really like the Israelites. Now listen, what did they have to do to return to the Lord? They threw away their idols, they directed their heart to God, and under the blood of the Lamb, when they surrendered, they were saved. How is your story and my story any different? That it is when we surrender to the Lamb. Isn't it awesome? We're going through Psalm 23 right now. Isn't it awesome that Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, and our good shepherd is also the Lamb who lays down his life for us? And when we surrender to him, to the blood of the Lamb, that's when we have victory. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? Amen. Lord, I pray this morning, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you so much for how your word is so true and it's the continuity of your word blows my mind how 1 Samuel 7 is such an accurate picture of who we are, where we can't save ourselves. We we cannot be victorious on our own. We don't have the strength. We don't have the might. We don't have any of that. So we thank you that victory comes when we surrender to you, when we forsake idols in our life, when we direct our heart to you only and we surrender to the blood that you shed for us. Lord, that's when we get victory. That's when we experience the life you have for us, and I thank you so much for that. Lord, I pray right now for every believer in this room that this was a reminder. Maybe maybe some of them came in so tired, so exhausted because they're they're working so hard to achieve favor with you and to achieve righteousness on their own. Can you just remind them, Lord, in the power of your word this morning that that's not how we're victorious. We're victorious by surrendering to what you have accomplished for us. The true art of the Christian life is just surrendering to your will. It's surrendering to who you are. Lord, I pray every believer be reminded of that this morning. And Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, if there's someone here that's never surrendered to what you've accomplished for us, to who you are for us, Lord, I pray that they would not leave this place. Holy Spirit, would you bother them? Lord, I pray they'd come down front and get a chance to meet me and I can lead them and show them what that next step is. Lord, I pray they would not leave this room today without having followed you. Well, we love you. We're so thankful for your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.